Greeting gardeners, we're glad that you have joined us. It is time to talk about plants. So we are here for Mid-American Gardener and I'm Diane Nolan, the host for the show. And I've got three really great guests. So let's find out a little bit about them. And we're gonna go first to Bill Vanderwhite and he's gonna tell us a little bit about him and answer an email question. Sure, uh, my name is Bill Vanderwhite. I'm a certified arborist and my specialty is trees and woody plants. And I do have a question about a dogwood, and it's about a kuza dogwood. For those not f familiar with kuza, it's uh, a dogwood native to Korea and Japan, and it's been used as a substitute for our native dogwood because it has a little bit of better disease resistance and better cold hardiness. Uh, the question is, the, uh, from Diane, I have a kuza dogwood that I planted three years ago. It never bloomed. Any suggestions? This is a common problem, I think, sometimes uh, people with questions with flowering trees and shrubs. Uh, and there's been a lot of different suggestions. Sometimes people say use superphosphate or pull away from the nitrogen. But really, all you need to do, I think, really is wait. Eventually, it will bloom. Uh, I've had the same experience where I had a, uh, a, uh, a, vi a viburnum, a black hole viburnum that I was uh, forming into a tree. And it just would not bloom, would not bloom, would not bloom. Seven years later, it bloomed, it's bloomed, you know, uh, reliably every year. So just have a little more patience. It should bloom. Oh, that's hard advice yeah, for people, but it is good <laughs> advice. So, wow, very good. Thank you, Bill. And then in the middle, let's go to Marty Alanya. Hi, my name is Marty Alanya. I'm a private landscaper. Um, I would say woody perennials, shrubs, um, small trees, even large trees, are kind of what I specialize in. Um, and we have a question here that I am going to try to address. Um, Larry in Northwest Indiana is interested in growing perennial herbs. Wonder if there was a rosemary that could be grown as a perennial there. Well, there certainly is, because they're usually hardy to about Canada. <laughs> so yeah. And would you purchase it in seed form or as a starter plant? Oh, get the plant. It's so much easier, and it's so much more gratifying, more quickly. So, in fact, find your, um, a local garden center, I'm sure you have them, and try to buy locally if you can. Um, there might even be people who um, have a small business in your area that are, that are doing herbs and vegetables, especially, and maybe only in the spring. So, you know, I like to find those people and try to give them some business, but if there's no one like that, I mean, certainly you can buy herbs just about anywhere in the spring, and there are a lot of them that are hardy, um, oregano, uh, sage, um, also those two also come in variegated colors. Sage comes in variegation, not quite as hardy as the plain green one, but it's worth a try, especially if you have a little bit of a microclimate. The oregano comes in a nice golden variety, very pretty. So the herb garden, doesn't have to be green. It can be a lot of different colors and it can be a lot of different shapes. There are some things that you can't perennialize. They just, they have to be planted every year, like dill, for example. But there are a lot of herbs that you can, you can overwinter and look for, look for variations on the theme. So you you have some visual interest. Chives, those are very nice as well. So and I love that time. Helps. Oh yes, time, to, yes, of course. I have to jump in with time there. Oh yeah, and it's very hardy. It's a great yeah, so. edging plant. Mm -hmm. Very low, it's right on the edge, very pretty. Well, thank you for that question from Northwest. Northwest Indiana. Very good. And all of those bloom too, as well. So most of them bloom blue or purple, but they're very attractive, very, very pretty. If you plant a little bit, I think you can really, really make a, not just a utilitarian spot, but attractive too. Okay, thank you very much, Marty. And now we have someone ready to go next to me. <laughs> Jim Schuster, what have you got for us? Well, uh, first of all, I'm a retired uh, University of Illinois horticulturist and plant pathologist. And I have a mountain ash question. The person said they had fire blight on it. They cut the diseased area out, and it has come back pretty good since then. And they want to know if there's anything they can spray on it so that the rest of the tree doesn't uh, get infected. Also, they have blackberries nearby, and they would not like to damage them. Well, first of all, let's describe the fire blight. I have on my right, your left, uh, a pear tree with fire blight, and on the, my left and your right is an apple tree with fire blight, and I want you to notice that it has a 
curling of the end of the branch. It basically, it's um, like a shepherd's crook, bends back on itself. 90% of the time, that is a common symptom of fire blight on any plant prone to fire blight, and that's any plant in the rose family. Rose being one of the most resistant, though. But apple, pear, cotone ash, and mountain ash are all highly susceptible to fire blight. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the control, if you are going to do this, is first of all, prune out the diseased area at least six or more inches below the infected area. Uh, and then the uh, uh, fungicide that you would use, uh, well, actually, it's a bacteria side. Uh, they used to use just plain streptomycin, and it had to be on the plant before the disease started. Uh, streptomycin has lost some of its uh, 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 potency. And so now you want to look for a product that has streptomycin sulfate. So streptomycin sulfate is what you want to use and follow all directions and precautions on the label and spray as soon as you start getting bud break. Very good. Wow. Those are nice too to show. Yeah. Yeah. Fire blade is the one that makes, I mean, I'm sorry, on pear tree, fire blade makes it look black, hence mm -hmm. what people think it looks like it burned up. Mm -hmm. On all the other rose family, it's more of a brown to dark brown. But it's but always got the... About 90% of the time, it's always got mm -hmm. that shepherd's crook yeah. on the bending back of the tip. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, and once you see it, you understand where the common name comes from, because right. it really does look like they got a little torch or so yeah. yeah. something. Yeah. Especially with this pear. Yep. Okay. A, a reminder, too, that mountain ash is not an ash. People get confused. Right. Mm -hmm. like Jim said it's in the rose family, so it's right. an entirely different animal than ash tree. Mm -hmm. Right. The common ash. So. Right. Very good. All right. Lots of things to learn. Well, we're going to go to a video email next, and it's from Dan in Lamont, and I'll read what he wrote about it as we are watching it. My lawn is being outcompeted for water in my front yard due to a pin oak with roots near the surface. I am not one to water my lawn in the summer dormant times. The grass comes back nice when the autumn rains comes, except of course above these roots. Other than giving up and planting cactus and sagebrush, any suggestions? Thank you in advance. Okay, a pin oak and grass, lawn. Someone jump in and I, I expect you all three to have an idea about it. I would go with mulch. Okay. Yeah, you could also do ground cover, but um, pin oak isn't the only plant that has close to the surface roots, and people don't like Even if you don't mind the look or the competition for the grass, and you do water, you still have to mow over them, and it damages the tree. Even if you, even if you primarily just hate hitting them with the mower, you're also damaging the tree. So yeah, do something different. Mulch, or a combination of mulch and ground cover. Um, there are a lot of options for ground cover. Um, some, again, green lawn, green tree. Do some variegated ground cover, a little bit of visual interest. I mean, after all, that's why you garden. Um, some perennial vinca, some carex. It's a grass, mm -hmm. so it looks kind of grassy, but it comes in a really nice whiter yellow variegation look really nice, light up that shady place a little bit, some pack of Sandra possibly, something like that. And I'll make a suggestion on that. If you're going to plant a ground cover, consider mulching with it, mm -hmm. because if you if mm -hmm. you plant all the ground cover in one year, you're, remember you're digging holes through the tree's root mm -hmm. system, and you could severely damage the tree, so do isolated pockets of the ground cover mm -hmm. and mulch in between that, and then with time you can keep removing mulch and adding more ground cover if you want the entire area covered in ground cover. And Jim, yep. you were going to give a caution about using cocoa mulch. Right, yes. Uh, uh, you know, if you're going to use mulch, use wood chips or, of any kind, uh, because a lot of people have started using cocoa mulch because of the smell, mm -hmm. but it's very toxic to wildlife and your dogs and cats, and they are drawn to it because mm -hmm. of the smell mm -hmm. of chocolate. So please, do not use cocoa shells for a mulch. And if you're using mulch, make sure it's uh, well composted or well aged, too. Mm -hmm. If you're able to get it fresh, please age it. All right, we really had fun chatting about that one, so <laughs> we want to thank you very much, Dan and Lamont. Well, let's go to the phone line. Oh, first off, let's have you send us one. If you have your own video or something that you have a problem with or you want to have it, something identified, send us uh, a video email at yourgarden at gmail.com. And we thank you very much. Diane, you do you know, it. I'm sorry, do you know if that video is what the 
the caller or the the man sent in. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because that area there, where the, where the tree was in the parking, and then across yeah. the sidewalk. Yeah. That's a great place for a perennial or a rose bed. I mean, it looks mm -hmm. like it's got a good exposure, lots of sun. And yeah, dig that up along that sidewalk and make your neighbors happy when they <laughs> walk by. So have a combination of sun and shade. Yeah, so. yeah. That, I mean, yes, a, a no, little, that was a little shrub border. Viewer. Yeah, a little shrub border there or a little mixed perennial bed. I mean, that could be really mm -hmm. pretty. And you don't have to mow it. <laughs> <laughs> Very controversial, no, <laughs> you know you're going to get that advice here with yeah. us. Well, let's go to the phone lines next, and let's start with line one, and it's about Russian sage. Hi there, line one. I, I've got a Russian sage that's about four or five years old, mm -hmm. and it's up about five foot high now, and I wonder about, should I prune that back? I'm afraid it's going to get long and leggy and fall over, or if, if I want to prune it, how much would I prune? Okay. Oh, I'd, if you don't answer, Marty, I will. I absolutely <laughs> would cut it back. Um, that's about the apex of how high it's going to get. And what will yes. happen is if it puts on a lot of growth at that size, then it's going to start splitting and breaking, and it'll prune mm -hmm. itself, and then it'll be really ugly. So I would cut it back to uh, – I'd wait in the spring till, till the spring, and i wait till you see the leaf break, you know, until it starts to butt out little leaves a little bit. And um, definitely cut back any dead, but I would really cut it back to probably, I'd probably take two-thirds of it off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that should be a good size to, to start out. Also, once you cut that top two-thirds off, then you can see, and you will, where there are big, larger woody stems that are, that are dead in the middle of that big growth, because if it's five feet tall, I'm sure it's at least this big around. Um, and you just kind of wiggle those and crack them off, take them out. So kind of just clean up the whole thing. So five feet is a little bit tall. That's yeah. a pretty Sometimes good size. Sometimes they'll break high on that and oh go yeah. farther. So oh yeah. give it a little bit of pruning. Yeah, it needs a little haircut there. Okay, well, let's go on to uh, line two next. And this question is about succulents. Hi there, line two. Hi. Um, I was wondering, I planted succulents this summer in a, a pot and they did just great i had them on the edge of the patio so they got kind of a little bit of rain and but i ended up i brought them in for the winter because i um i wanted to see if i could save them but they're just they're not doing very well i mean the soil i bought the kind that you know they suggested to plant them in the sandy type of soil mm -hmm. um i took and misted them for a while and then they, they started kind of like they were dying so then I gave them a good drink of water and they still just don't act like they're doing very well so I was just wondering what a suggestion or if the succulents actually can be brought in during the winter well, yeah I was gonna say they can I grow them mm -hmm. uh, but they are related to cacti so they need a whole lot less water than most yeah. other indoor plants. Mm -hmm. So you got to ca be cautious about how frequently you water the plants. And if you do water and you have the water going into a tray underneath them, that uh, pot should not be sitting in that water in that tray either because that will keep the soil a little too wet too long. Mm -hmm. And then also uh, check them out for uh, mealybugs. Mealybugs yeah. love succulents and it's not uncommon to bring them in. I mean get mealybugs on the plants during the summer and then have them go wild on the root system of the plants during the uh, time they're in the house in the winter time. Yeah. Also, are you certain the succulents you have are not winter hardy? And also, oh, mm -hmm. if uh, are you? Okay, and also, if you have like a, oh, a glassed-in porch that doesn't freeze really hard, that'd be a great place. Or if you do have to bring them in the house, try to find a cool spot that's still bright and, you know, you really don't have to water them very much at all. When you do, wait till they're really, really dry. Water them really thoroughly. Like he said, pour off any water that stands in the bottom of the tray. And then leave them until they're really dry again. And don't bother misting them. It's not a, they're, they're not tropical. They don't care. They like it dry. They don't mind it <laughs> indoors at all. It's usually dry and hot. They're, they're succulents. They dig yeah. it. 
Okay, well, we hope that helps you out. And succulents are really very popular, so it's worth, it's worth trying them. Okay, let's move on to a tree question. And this is on line three, and it's about October Glory Red Maple. Hi there. Hi. Um, my, this maple tree was planted three years ago. <coughs> And um, just this early summer, I noticed that there was some bark missing. And then late fall, there's quite a bit of bark missing from it. And I called the guy that planted it, and he had never seen anything like it. But he went back to his farm, and he found like five other trees with this same problem. I called the home extension office in Taylorville, and they told me just to wrap it that this was common with soft maples. Is it on one side or is it all the way around? It's, it's on one side. It's on the south side. Okay. Yeah. And there. that's what I was told that that's where it would be. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one possibility. Quite often um, in the winter we get what we call uh, sun scalding or frost cracking where uh, mm -hmm. the outside temperatures are quite cold but the sun will be quite intense and the bark uh, heats up and then with rapid cooling it will cause some splitting and you get bark peeling off. Um, now the suggestion to wrap it, sometimes they've used this craft paper or the, what you commonly see trees wrap with, really uh, doesn't affect enough of a difference to, to, uh, to solve that problem. Yeah. So but hey, that's yeah. one theory. The, the other thing, I don't know, it, it, if you hit it with a lawnmower that can initiate mm -hmm. Uh, bark wounding and people are surprised how big of a wound or a canker you could get on a tree just from a you know a yeah. repeated bark wounding it's not uncommon with uh, lawn mowers or you know weed whips and that sort of thing and they mentioned the wrapping it's already been damaged the wrap is too late yeah that's and even true. if you were going to try it and uh, one of the things uh, we used to recommend at one time was to take indoor white latex paint the cheapest, crummiest indoor white mm -hmm. latex paint you can, and mix it with nine more parts of water to make it really dilute, mm -hmm. and paint the south and west side of the tree. And that would reflect the sun and reduce the chance of the sun scalding and freezing, thawing, and cracking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it wears off, and then by the time it wears off, the tree is adapted to uh, the thing. Because generally, when they plant, get a tree, it's turned a little bit from where it, the way it was grown in the nursery. and that. That's Other true. bark is not mm -hmm. quite as That's hardy true. to the sun. Yep. A lot of nurseries will mark their trees uh, mm -hmm. for the orientation of how to plant it, but usually people planting it <laughs> yeah. ignore it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Gosh, so. that's a really good idea. Yeah. I didn't realize. Yeah, that, so you can plant it with that, that same orientation to, you know, so we'll Perfect face the sense. same way it did in the nursery. Right. Grandma always said, <laughs> yeah, if you dig up a plant, plant it facing the way it was where you got it. Thank mm -hmm. you, Grandma. She knew. Okay. Well, that was very interesting. Thank you for your question. Let's go next to a special Did You Know? Okay, and now we're back. We're going to do another um, bit of, sh uh, I guess, emails and maybe show and tell. So, Bill, let's start with you. Uh, I have a question about an ash tree from uh, Lynn, and it said she lives in a small community and have 18 trees, or 16 trees that have been identified with ash borer insect. And uh, the cost to treat these is quite costly. And she said that she heard that someone said that ash borer is in the trees, um, it probably isn't beneficial to treat them, and she wanted to ask if that was correct. I would be hesitant to treat or to, to go through the expense of treating the ash trees if the borer is already present. The problem with ash borers, uh, for those of you who, who don't, aren't aware of this, is that uh, we're talking about the emerald ash borer. It's killed tens of millions of trees in the Midwest. But the uh, problem is, is presented by the larva, which gets underneath the bark and will cut off the flow of water and nutrients, essentially the tree's circulatory system. So uh, because this is cut off, you would have uh, great difficulty if you're uh, trying to pump a chemical or an insecticide into the tree and to have it take it up. So uh, your money would be best spent in uh, probably planting new trees. 
Mm -hmm. That's my thought, at least. But, but not ash. <laughs> but not ash, correct. <laughs> It'd be hard, I think, to purchase an ash yeah. these days, too. You could get one yeah. cheaply. Right. Well, I know, <laughs> but remember why. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> okay, thanks, Bill. And now Marty. Laura from Metamora writes that the front bed of my home, I don't know if we have a picture for that or not, <coughs> uh, faces north. It's shaded by a silver maple. I have a picture, partially shaded by tall conifers. The partial full shade and dry clay make it hard to get plants to grow, despite soaker hoses and mulching, yearly compost added. And she wondered if we had any recommended recommendations for plants that would do well. And I do. Um, dogwood. Um, she's especially interested in something with winter interest and color and texture. Um, dogwoods are natural understory trees. Um, they have blooms in the spring, great fall color, beautiful gray bark, no matter what kind you opt for. They're really attractive. Um, actually, other members of the Cornus family, red twig or yellow twig dogwood, they would do well. The red twig especially comes in a really nice variegated variety called uh, ivory halo. There are a couple other ones as well. They have great color for lighting up a shady area. Also, the dogwood trees themselves bloom white, pink, or red, and they also, some of the cousas come with variegated leaves, so very attractive. Um, also, other understory trees as well, um, service berry, uh, red bud, it just depends on, on really what you find attractive really the, what your personal preference. All of those trees are little understory trees and they would do great underneath the shade of those larger trees. Also, ferns have a different look than any of the other plants that you um, listed that you have. And not just the typical ostrich fern, but also ferns come in a, in a pretty spectacular variety of colors and form. So those might be something you want to opt for. Also, father gilla great blooms. They're fragrant. They have fantastic fall color. Really nice. Choke cherry, aronia, especially the red variety, great color in the fall. And they are traditionally planted in the sun and they get a little large. You need to get the smaller varieties or you can just prune them. But the fall color is unbeatable in my opinion and they are so adaptable. I've seen them growing in pretty deep shade and they just troop right on. They don't care. So I hope that helps. Wow, that was a good primer on <laughs> understory plants. That's great. Thanks, Marty. And now you, Jim. Okay, this is from Dorothy in Altamont, uh, Illinois, and she had mamas that had slugs, roly polies or uh, sow bugs, and snails on them. She treated for those insects, wow. and then the mums started turning brown and figured that it was a fungus disease. And the most common one that will go after the flowers on the mums is botrytis or gray mold. And it's a disease that uh, causes the uh, petals to turn brown. It'll mm -hmm. go after the f open flowers. It'll go after the flower buds. It'll attack leaves, the leaf bud, and the stems of plants. And will actually even grow down into the root system and totally destroy the plants. Um, generally, you can cut that off. But if you want to use fungicides, there are captan, copper sulfate, manclozeb, and chlorophyanol. And you need to make sure you follow all label directions. But one of the things I want to point out to you is that a lot of people confuse old age flowers with the disease Botrytis. Mm -hmm. And old age always starts on the oldest petals on the uh, edges and works inward. And it generally tends to attack almost all the outer petals at the same time. Mm -hmm. Botrytis tends to go after the inner petals and will okay. tend to be in the middle of the petal or at the base of the petal and work outward. It occasionally starts on the outside, but uh, I have a mum here that you can see that the inner uh, petals are all darker brown. I mean, it's, I know it's faded a little bit on you, but the inner petals are darker brown and the outer ones were used to be yellow. But check your flowers closely for inner petals turning brown first. If it's like on a petunia, look for brown spots, but eventually it will take it out. And it grows at any temperature between 32 and 84 degrees. It releases spores when it's uh, on a rising humidity and on a lowering humidity and needs free standing water to actually infect the flowers. That could be any time. All summer long. Yeah, yeah. we garden. Yes, yeah. the entire growing season. I 
You're a fountain of information. You know what? So <laughs> you want to remove those. Yeah. Like immediately. immediately. Yes, take and, them and, off. And uh, don't just throw them on the ground. You either burn <laughs> them or you d dig a hole and bury them. Yeah. And you know, it's such a habit. You do deadhead. But sure. I actually take a bucket and I'll deadhead yeah. out because I saw someone who I admired who did that with their deadheading daylily. So uh, don't throw them on the ground. And, and mm -hmm. Mama is one of the uh, more so simple plants. So are peonies. So if you grow peonies and you see your buds turning black or the mm -hmm. flowers dying, you got got oftentimes botrytis there. And the don't. killing of the buds is what they call, oh, I just, it just went out of uh -oh. my mind. Uh-oh. <laughs> we may have to keep them hanging yeah. on that. Right. <laughs> Tune well, in next week. Thank you so <laughs> much for watching. We are glad you tuned in. Get out and garden, whether it's inside or looking through seed catalogs, but do some gardening. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>